Hello, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient times to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Dr. Kristen Nuschel, author of Living by the Sword, Weapons and Material Culture in France and Britain, 600 to 1600, published by Cornell University Press, November 15th, 2020. Uh, thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. So first, um, how did you get into um, studying and writing a book on swords, you know, during this period, for this period? Well, I had been involved for a long time in two related concerns. One of them is what we call material culture studies, which is the study of the stuff people live with mm -hmm. and how it shapes them and their world. And secondly, I've been working on aristocratic culture for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, what got me started, uh, started on this project on swords was stumbling across a document that made me ask a lot of questions about what we think we know about the history of swords. Mm -hmm. And that said, it is very unusual for a historian to write a book that covers such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so um, that journey was the result of my curiosity about that that one document got me started on. Okay. And so why do you focus on, um, and I can guess the answer, I think, but uh, why do you focus on France and Britain? Well, I was trained as a historian of France. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, it's also unusual but although not unheard of by any means, but it is unusual to do research in more than one country, more than one nation state, because the political history and so on and the nature of the documents make you an expert on one thing and not another thing. Mm -hmm. I got in, I started doing getting interested in comparing with British history, partly because I had an opportunity to live extensively in Britain. Mm -hmm. And that got me started on doing some comparative work. And the archives were similar enough that it, it was um, not such a stretch for me to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the blurb for the book talks about uh, or describes it as a, it sort of looks at the warrior culture. And um, mm -hmm. how do you break down the book? Like are the chapters, is it chronological or is it thematic? How, how does that work? Uh, it's chronological. And uh, because as a historian, it's pretty unusual to abandon chronology. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is also thematic within the chronology in that I emphasize certain themes, for example, the way in which growing literacy and keeping track of belongings affected how belongings were valued over time. Mm -hmm. So there are themes within the chronological flow. Okay. And... Um... Starting at 600, what was the sort of what was the um, importance or significance of swords at, at the beginning? Well, at the beginning, we are looking at a period where there are very few records of the kind that you and I would think of. Nobody is keeping written track of their belongings and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at mostly archaeological records and some ha histories written by Latin educated clerics. But most of the evidence comes from archaeology. That was not my own work. I was resorting to, I was making use of the work of other scholars who have been out doing the digging. But that's what we mostly rely on in that early period. Mm -hmm. So during this period then, I, I imagine it was only the richest or most powerful who had swords to use or display. Is that is that the case? Yes, swords. Um, yes but it's complicated. Swords were rarer than we think, but that does not mean that you had to have a sword to be a warrior of note. Mm -hmm. Many of them did, but there were other weapons that were also very valuable in, and other forms of symbolic wealth that were very valuable in those early centuries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, often when you see... Uh... You know, so when people delve into fantasy and, you know, and look back and fantasize about the past, you know, the sword is the, the preeminent thing in these older ages. So it sounds like you're saying that that's not necessarily the case, perhaps. Yeah, that's really 
one of the most interesting questions that, in fact, got me started on all of this, is the way that we uh, fetishize swords in the present and fantasize about their use in the past. Mm -hmm. And one of the themes that I trace through the book is the way in which past people, people who live in what we think of as the Middle Ages, themselves were fantasizing about great swords that existed in their own mythic past. Hmm. So, yeah, uh, we we tend to fantasize about them in the past, and my book was partly an effort to explore how they got that fantastic aura around them. Mm -hmm. So, again, looking at the, the older ages here, you know, 600 or and thereabouts, were there many ceremonial swords, or have they found mostly usable swords that had significance or, you know, adornments or anything like that? That's a great question. Um, they have found both. They have found swords that were obviously, you know, remnants of swords. They don't survive in perfect condition, of course. Mm -hmm. They have found swords that obviously had been used and also swords that were created solely for some kind of ritual function, like the barrier of a great chieftain. Mm -hmm. And the sword that we could ret we have retrieved from some grave shows no signs of having been used in life. Mm -hmm. So both, both systems. And, and, of course, that creates all kinds of confusion for us trying to interpret what they meant at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And would you say so... The swords of France and, and Britain from this this period, were they all produced in those countries, or, or were they sort of, uh, did they come from elsewhere? Another great question. You're talking about these early centuries now? <laughs> right. Um, uh, that's one of the interesting things to think about. Um, mostly, we can't tell where they were made, but we can tell where the steel came from. Mm-hmm. And there were in these early centuries, there was up until around 900, there were some areas where really good steel could come from, and so we can trace that. Mm -hmm. But where they were manufactured, particularly blades, it's a little hard to tell. Um, and people also look at things like the design of the hilt, the scabbard, mm -hmm. and the scabbard, and so on. But yeah, we don't always know. What areas could they could they get the material that they needed uh, for these swords? Well, they could get they could locally manufacture very usually rather poor quality steel. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you need iron ore for that. Or they could they sometimes could access better quality steel that in the early Middle Ages was produced in what we think of as the Near East, say, Iran, that area. Um, and the, the trade with that area lacks and wanes according to larger economic patterns and so on. Hmm. There, was a, there was a trade in lots of goods, uh, which tends to surprise people. For example, one of the great chieftains whose burial we have a lot of artifacts from who died around 625 in Britain, mm -hmm. he has things in his grave that came from what is today modern Syria and other parts of Eurasia. And so things were traded over longer distances than we may imagine. Yeah, the Dark Ages don't seem so dark when you consider um, information like that. Yeah, no. Yeah, and more, more goods and people have moved around than we are we usually think of so what um what about swords i guess most of them are found in graves but we're again with the earlier centuries i'm focusing on here uh, mm -hmm. did they find have they found any at say battle sites or um sites where there was some kind of violence or conflict that's also a neat question the only ones that were found at battle sites that i am aware of are from later, what we think of as the High Middle Ages, say um, 1200 and after. Mm -hmm. So looking at this stretch, starting with 600, at what point did you see a significant sort of change in, in, in what you were looking at? Maybe in the types of swords or how they were passed down or, or, you know, as you mentioned, record keeping. Like where do you see a big jump 
a change in what mm-hmm. you were looking at? Mm-hmm. That's a very interesting question, too, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, I should say that other scholars working before me have assembled typologies of all of the found swords that we know of mm-hmm. and have classified them by their hilt design, the pommel design, the shape of the blade, and so on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, my work, I drew on lots of people's work to do this work, but I'd say there is one major watershed that I would point to, and that is the years around, say, 1300 to 1350, when a couple of things happened. First of all, record keeping increases. There is more literacy, more aristocrats can afford to keep clerks around to keep track of their belongings. And so we know more, which of course prejudices our view about how much change is going on, right? Mm -hmm. But secondly, change is also going on in that uh, there is a somewhat dramatic change in other bits of material culture, particularly clothing and armor. And when what we typically think of in terms of medieval armor, you know, somebody walking around in a big clanking suit of armor, mm-hmm. that dates from the very end of the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. But single pieces of armor, breastplates and so on, start appearing in the 14th century, the 1300s. Okay. And the minute you have people protected with plate armor, a sword that can slash at you, cannot hurt you as much. You need to be able to pierce the joints in armor. So swords start changing shape and becoming pointed as well as having blades. They have tips that can pierce joints. Mm -hmm. And so that's the real watershed in the development of of swords is, is the 14th century, let's say. I'm speaking with Kristen Nuschel, author of Living by the Sword. You can find more information about her work at kristinnuschel.com. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep up with my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at fullcontactnerd.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. Do the, um, does the cost of swords change? You may not have any information on this, but do, do, do swords become more difficult to produce at this point with this change or any significant um, other impacts? I I am not able to answer that because to be able to answer that, you'd have to have records of how much they cost at all stages, but we don't have the written records for the earlier period. Mm -hmm. Um, Swords, and and keep in mind also two other things. One is that swords are a composite artifact. They are made up of a blade and also the hilt. Mm -hmm. And the hilt is the blade, a good blade was expensive because it took, 200 hours of labor to create, but the the hilt of a, of a sword could have jewels in it and all kinds of things. So it depends on what kind of sword you're talking about and whether it was made for ceremonial purposes or was one, it was a workaday blade. And you also need a record of how much it, it was paid for it, how much money was shelled out for that particular sword. I have I have never run across a record of I want this great really neat sword and it's going to have all these things on it and here's how much I'm paying for it. Mm-hmm. I've never run across a record like that. I've run across lots of records of swords being refitted or repaired or re-embellished or made more decorative on the hilt. Mm-hmm. But that, those are the only records I've come across. So it's impossible to say whether they increase in uh, cost generally, except for that towards the end of the Middle Ages, more steel is available. Mm -hmm. So that, in theory, should lower the cost, but I don't have any comparative figures on that. I can tell you that armor is more expensive than swords generally. Hmm. 
Okay. Because until until the end of the High Middle Ages, until about 1350 or even 1400, people were still wearing chain mail. And that was enormously costly because of the hours of work it took to produce it. Hmm. So at this point uh, in the 14th century, you said previously um, swords weren't the only sort of preeminent or significant weapon as far as, uh, you know, sort of sort of their um, their symbolic importance, maybe. Do you see that in the 4th century? Does that change where, where swords become more preeminent among the various weapons? Well, a couple of things on that. First of all, I think swords are a preeminent weapon, but they're not the only weapon. Mm -hmm. You have a, a great warrior would have uh, spears and axes and that kind of thing. But they, they are nonetheless a prestige weapon because if you, as you implied earlier on, not everybody has one, right? Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to, say, the 14th century, the 1300s, the higher up the social scale you are, the more swords you have. Mm -hmm. You have very, very elaborate ones for certain purposes. You have workaday ones. You have trophy swords that you have taken from foes. In West European aristocratic families, the French and the English, you end up getting swords that stylistically seem to be the kind of sword that is produced in Muslim lands, for example. Mm. These are trophy-like objects, right? And as you get towards the end of the Middle Ages and into the 16th century, you more and more and more swords are produced because more steel is available. Mm -hmm. And you begin to have swords that are worn every day along with a matching dagger as sort of part of an outfit, as one scholar calls it, masculine jewelry. Mm -hmm. So you have lots of swords so at I, that point. So I would have thought that... Um earlier in the period as well, because of the Crusades, I was expecting you to say that there were a fair amount of, say, Middle Eastern or Near Eastern swords and weapons, but it sounds like, for whatever reason, they were getting more of them later into the Crusades. Is that, am I... Well, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting perspective. Um, but the problem is that it's not until the Crusades are effective, the uh, Crusades in the Mediterranean are effectively over by 1300. It's not until 1300-ish, more or less, that we begin to get household accounts that record the presence of these objects. Mm -hmm. So who knows what they had in 1100 or right mm -hmm. after the First Crusade. Um, that is, would, wouldn't it be great if we knew that, but we don't. So um, for this period, six, 600 to 1600, I'm curious about the... Um, the connection with religion that swords have, um, and I'm specifically thinking about swords being used. Um, you see them, the image of swords on a king's, you know, with the king has his sword on his tomb, you know, the, his tomb face, uh, and then you also have swords used for knighting, you know, f semi-religious, you know, political practices. Right. I'm curious right. about that. Well, there are lots of facets. To that issue. Mm -hmm. First of all, um, swords are not the only objects that are mundane objects that are hallowed. For example, the French kings have a holy banner of the, the Oriflam that is supposed to be the banner of Saint Denis, Saint Denis. Um, so there are lots of objects that, are, that have a sort of holy aura to them. Mm -hmm. um, that said, swords can be made holy also in a mundane way, in ways that we don't usually think about. By, for example, the belt that held a sword, and belts were often associated with swords, that belt could have lots of relics sewn into it. Mm. That was quite common, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but the swords, with the association with knighthood, um, that's interesting, and the association with coronations, too. That's interesting because the, the question really is, who controls the sword? Does, does the church have some kind of control over the sword? Does the church bestow the sword on the monarch or on the would-be knight? There, there's, and in coronations, you can see there's a tension there. And in knighthood, the, the knight 
let's say, places his sword on the altar and then it gets given to him in the dubbing ceremony. But there's always both a secular and a sacred dimension to that sword, right? Mm -hmm. But it is certainly true that there is a religious aura, if you will, to knighthood that is emphasized more by some commentators at the time and in some imaginative literature, like some of the grail stories from the Arthurian legends, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's, and of course, remember that there are some knights who are uh, monks as well as fighting knights. There are certain orders of monastic orders who are fighting knights. So there, there is a blend of religiosity and ferocity or, or violence, if you will, in some, it's, a, it's one of the characteristics or one of the facets of knighthood, but not the only one. Is there anything to the, the shape of the sword being, you know, almost cross-like? You know, you've seen some pictures where people bow with their sword in the dirt, you know, almost like they're bowing to the cross. Yes, there is exactly. that. Quite right. The hilt of the sword is cruciform and in, in a typical sword. And that is one of the reasons why swords have such a, uh, are such flexible symbolic instruments. Mm -hmm. They can represent the cross, they can um, represent violence, they can also represent peace. You, know, you can um, use them imaginatively for all kinds of purposes. So what, what I, I don't know if this question has any kind of answer, but just a thought, you know, when I'm thinking of this period in France and Britain, you know, they weren't unified kingdoms um, Correct. through this period. So I'm just curious if that the fact that there are divisions within these countries, did, does that did that feed into your research at all? Did that uh, reveal anything? Well, one of the reasons I one of the good reasons why I chose to do two countries that once rather than one country is because we tend to get a little bit overwhelmed by the story of the centralization of nations and the ways in which these entities became nation states as though it were always going to happen right um and it's uh it keeps us from noticing and and marginalizing the kind of violence that was always going on Mm -hmm. in these states. And when you look at that, that's sometimes when you can see how widely dispersed weapons were. In Again, you have to wait for records to appear after around 1300, but, mm -hmm. but you can see how many people had weapons and expected to use them, even quite common people. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wanted to touch on that now that you bring it up. So say between 1300 and 1600, do you have many records? It seems like you just said there a lot of people could now have swords, um, almost to the point where it's uh, it's almost like as common as a garden implement, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That that's the feeling I get. Do they tend to lose, in a sense? Do they tend to lose their their um, sort of their mystique at this point? Like I know there is probably treasured swords, but does its symbolism change? Oh, that's that's the question. That's a great question. Let me let me give a couple of facts facts to break back us up here. Mm -hmm. One of them is is that as um, you were asking about these nations not being really unified, the other factor here is that beginning in the 1330s, there's this little problem called the Hundred Years' War, mm -hmm. in which the English are fighting in France for over a hundred years, mm -hmm. and during that war that more or less endless war, there were lots and lots of paid fighters who couldn't support themselves all the time and sort of took to a kind of brigandage. And you can see amongst all of these fighters how widely dispersed swords were, uh, weapons of all kinds were, and how ordinary people would pick up armor and arms on the battlefield and would be appear to be much higher status than they had started out because they made use of what they found. Right? Mm. But by the end of the Middle Ages, by around 1500, a lot of swords are being produced because steel is more widely available and a lot of production of swords is going on. A lot of them are very poor swords. 
mm-hmm. but a lot of people can now have swords. So now to your question, does this affect the mystique of swords? Absolutely. And that's why the most elite people start paying much more attention to their swords and start collecting more of them and start making sure they are embellished in all kinds of very fancy ways. And these are the swords that you typically see in museums. Mm. Um, and that's why wearing a sword in a, in a perfectly calibrated sort of outfit with a dagger is a, a requirement of being an elite man. Um, and this is also the time when fencing manuals come along because you need to be able to master all the different kinds of sword work if you're really going to be one of these elites, if any old person can have a sword. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, as as the mystique, as swords become more common, there are more and more ways in which higher status people try to set themselves apart by means of the kinds of swords they have and how they know how to use them. Wow, so that's that's pretty interesting because again, you know, we have fantasy, you know, fantasy writing and movies, you know, shows, you know, all these people, you know, who know how to use their swords, but now what you're saying is that the average, you know, the average person with, you know, their poor quality sword is just hacking away and it's again the elites are have their own schools, their manuals, they're practicing fighting almost not only as as a way to be a better fighter but also as sort of a you know say dancing in front of a crowd to show how well you can dance you know it almost seems again like performance of your of of your elite status oh absolutely and um a couple i would add a couple of things that the status of elites in pre-modern europe is always has to be partly about performance because their claim to their right to live that way is entirely arbitrary. Mm. It's based entirely on who they are, Mm. not on who voted for them. So they, they have to be able to perform their exalted status in a variety of ways, how they dress, their generosity, how much they give away to other people, you know, their, their retinue as it were, Mm -hmm. and by these various skills, um, sword play and so on. Um, so yes, absolutely. Performance is always part of elite identity. Yeah. So I would imagine then there would be, um, some, what's the word I'm looking for? They would hold on to that prerogative, you know, so if people are taught how to use their swords, I guess sword masters would not be encouraged to take on poor students or, you know, the average, you know, someone off the street, because then that would give them not only skills, but a prestige that maybe they shouldn't have in this, the way this society is stratified. Yeah, I think, um, keep in mind a couple of things. One of them is, is that the manuals for fencing Mm -hmm. are circulating more because 15th century printing is invented. Okay. So these are, these are circulating and so on. And that, that yes, elites affect exclusive status with their their swords and so on, but they have to rely on the fighting abilities of people whom they can gather around themselves and their retinues, and that does include some common people. Okay. So it's it's a it's a uh, sort of a strange hybrid. Yes, they are exclusive, but they are also at the top of a pyramid of people on whom they depend. And the other thing I would say is that if you look at the manuals and the celebratory manuscripts that talk about great tournaments, say at the turn of the 16th century from around 1500 or thereabouts, Mm -hmm. what they celebrate is the fact that a great aristocrat can not only fight with a sword, but also knows how to fight with an axe and also knows how to fight with a mace, and also knows how to fight on horseback with a lance, the typical joust, in other words, Mm -hmm. which is by far the most expensive thing that anyone can do because of the cost of maintaining the horse Mm -hmm. and having the horse in armor as well as the man. So, in other words, as, as swords become more common, 
there are lots and lots of other behaviors that are exclusive to the most elite aristocrats that can be used to, as you put it, perform their power. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking with Kristen Nuschel, author of Living by the Sword. You can find more information about her work at kristennuschel.com. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep up with my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at fullcontactnerd.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. What about during the time when you have more records, how about, did you see inventories where um, there were swords that had importance because, you know, such and such enemy once owned this or, you know, heirlooms, again, you know, things captured in combat, um, or maybe they just had a story attached to them that, that gave them importance. Did you come across that in any documents? Yes. And that's a really good question. And that, that kind of um, story attached to sword is it was what was present in that one document I found that got me investigating all of this, that got me started on the research that came, that resulted in this book. Mm -hmm. Because there was a record of maintained by the King of France around the year 1500. It was a long list of just such things, swords and axes and so on, that all had stories attached to them. Mm. And, you know, that were won in the great battle of thus and such by so and so. Mm. And it was unusual in that all of the events were recorded in this document. Typically, you see things recorded as old swords, but not always with the name of the battle or whatever recorded, because keep in mind the clerk who's recording the sword's existence is recording that sword's existence for some purpose such as a will so that it gets passed to the right person, not because he knows the story of why that great old sword is in the collection at all. Right? Mm -hmm. So this French royal document I found was quite unusual and quite interesting for that reason. And I spent a long time in the book talking about how we can understand these supposed stories which are centuries old by the time they're recorded in the document. Mm -hmm. How could they possibly be true? <laughs> How often did you come across swords or any other weapons with names, you know, like such as Excalibur? Excalibur, <laughs> yeah. Uh, rarely. Mm -hmm. But but that was one of the ways in which swords became memorialized and fantasized and fetishized mm -hmm. uh, after the fact by people even in the Middle Ages. It's our idea that they did this, but they did that too, mm -hmm. because they were themselves fantasizing about great weapons from some prior magical time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this might be out of the scope, outside the scope of your research, but did you come across anyone sort of mocking or, or maybe, you know, taking a lighthearted approach to this um, fetishization of swords, or, or any weapons, really? Um... Yeah, I think, n no, I didn't, but not the kind of records I was looking at. I was looking at records that, that tended to be literal recordings of objects that were physically present to the clerk who made the record. Okay. But um, you do, one of the things that um, people who, bits of the material surroundings of medieval people, um, is that, and one of the things that we know, those of us who work on, oral culture and literate culture, and that's another one of my focuses in my research, we know that how, how witty they were, how they were able to make puns about things and um, use their language to create puns and make fun of things and so on. So they may not, they would have taken things very seriously and that enabled them to play word games with them in order to um, create sort of moments of tension or moments of, of verbal combat with their 
antagonists. It was a way of another form of performance, a verbal antagonism. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of that going on um, that, that they took forward seriously and enabled them to enter that kind of play, mm-hmm. if you see what I mean. Yeah. So considering that you did compare Britain and France, what significant difference did you find between those two areas? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I, uh, I will say, first of all, mostly I was interested in what was common between the two of them. Okay. Uh, because, again, I was trying to avoid national stories, if you will. Right? Okay, right. Um, what um, begins to uh, be different in the 16th century is that by the time you get to 1600, the French have been engulfed in civil wars over religion. We think of them as the religious wars, although, of course, it was more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. And the British, at the same time, have been mostly internally, mostly, at peace through that same time. Mm-hmm. So there is a real difference in the kind of evidence you can get. Yeah from the two examples at that point. You get some examples from battles from the British, uh, excuse me, from the French, and more evidence, for example, of how swords are, are bequeathed among friends and wills from the British. The other, the other thing that's important is that there are different legal requirements in the two societies about how things are recorded at death. Mm-hmm. And so you sometimes don't get the same kinds of records from the two. Hmm. Okay. What about church records? Um, did did you find mention of church record or mention of swords in church records? And... Yes. You, what you end up with um, is swords, for example, regarding coronation regalia. Uh, the records would have been in the, at a certain point, would have been under the control of the uh, clerics in Westminster Abbey, mm. where the British coronation took place. Yes, some some church records, by which we mean typically monastic records, monasteries that kept careful record of all of the gifts that were given to them, or the regalia that was given to them to use for ceremonial purposes. It's the monasteries that really have the power in most of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do have records of things in their care when they survive, Mm -hmm. which is, of course, not, there's not an unbroken chain by any means. Mm -hmm. How about, what what effect did did the Protestant Reformation, and again, these wars of religion, as you you mentioned did they, did they have any effect on what you were seeing or did you see any anything there they didn't have any effect in the period i'm looking at on the material culture no they were they were just a means by which because people are fighting and we had in, in among other things we have more evidence in the form of engravings that were printed and circulated in the 16th century mm-hmm. um we have more evidence of what people were carrying around or literally carrying were common people carrying swords, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, but yeah, the con- conflicts make more things visible, mm. I would say. Okay. And um, so uh, in the 1500s, thinking of the 1500s, did you come across, did any of the records mention the New World or anything, you know, any weapons being sent to the New World or, or anything like that? No, not the records I was looking at. But there are, we, you know, in the other people there are many records of people referring to oh well we took such and such to the new world and we came back and they brought um native people back with them and that kind of thing but i wasn't looking at any of those records Mm -hmm. okay and so why did you conclude and maybe you mentioned this before but why why did you conclude at 1600 that's a great question a couple of reasons uh one is going to sound sort of offhand, and I will say, because you have to stop somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) It couldn't go on forever. Um, And the, um, by the time you get to 1600, the uh, sword, the other thing that we had, you and I have not yet mentioned here is important, and that is 
gunpowder weapon. Mm -hmm. They have, by that time, uh, 1600 is roughly when the invention of volley fire makes uh, outfitting a bunch of infantry with primitive muskets a an effective thing to do on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So swords are firmly an elite weapon by that time. Mm -hmm. And that's really, in some ways, that's the end of the story of how swords got to be imagined as elite weapons. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, I, my own, I was trained as a 16th century historian. My own interests are earlier now. They're in the 15th and 14th centuries. And I, I was satisfied I'd answered my own questions about what what the story of swords is up until that point. And I end in my conclusion in the book by jumping into the present mm -hmm. and talking about how we now in the present think of swords as being always what we imagine them to be, rather than how did they get to where, to how we imagine them to be, which I think I've answered in the book. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, as you did your research, did you see any, any significant questions that would be interesting to answer it, same themes, but say looking at Scandinavia or Germany and Eastern Europe, that sort of those areas. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, that there's, there's a lot to be added. If you had time to go into other archives and look for, um, other records, uh, other family records particularly. If I had had time, the first thing I would have added would have been the Low Countries hmm. because they were so important in the late Middle Ages. Hmm. Um, and the aristocracy was um, you know, literate and kept a lot of records and so on. That's what I would have added immediately. Hmm. Okay. Um, so then just to talk about the resources you use, you mentioned... Um, uh, much, I guess, a fair amount of what you used to do your research. Was there anything else uh, that you used that you might might not have mentioned yet? Well, you mean the kinds of records I used? Yeah. Is that what yeah. you're asking? Or, or the, okay. arch the archives you used, or the collections? Yeah, yeah um, I used a lot of uh, correspondence, which is where you can you know, nobles writing to other nobles or or gentry to gentry mm -hmm. in which they talk about giving each other gifts and that kind of thing. So correspondence is one way you can um, see relationships and the importance of objects. I was also looking at wherever I could find them at household inventories. What is in a chateau, a castle, a manor house at any one time? Mm -hmm. Um and those are wonderful, fun documents uh, because they're always snapshots in time. They're not mm -hmm. done randomly. They're done for purposes like at the death of somebody mm -hmm. to be an inventory of his or her belongings. And I, I was also looking at royal records of monies spent on um, things like, for example, when a king had a great joust and ceremony around some holiday um, what what did he spend on decorative armor and outfits and swords for his closest companions who were going to have some kind of ceremonial joust mm -hmm. so royal records in the National Archives in France and Britain and correspondence and household accounts that are preserved in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and the British Library in London, mm -hmm. um, mostly. That's what I used. Did you, um, considering Christmas is around the corner, um, I don't know how, how how strongly the Christmas holiday was celebrated during any of this period, but did you come across gifts, Christmas gifts that included swords or weapons? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Most of the Christian holidays, like... Um, Candle Mass, which is our twelfth night, or Easter, uh, May Day, St. John the Baptist Feast Day, various feast days, all the way through the year, Saints Day, if we would think of them as. All, Easter is the holiday that is celebrated the most, and after that, everything is more or less equal. And when you can run into royal records particularly, 
you find uh, them giving mostly they don't they give daggers and other personal ornamentation mm. to great aristocrats in their retinue first that that can all afterwards be remembered as oh that was the dagger I got for um, Epiphany right Twelfth Night um, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. What part of this research did you find most enjoyable? Oh, that's a great question. I love inventories of household belongings. I love them Mm -hmm. because you, I had been doing work on those for a long time, and you find out so much about how people really lived Mm -hmm. when you see the things they had. And one of the pieces of research I did before I really began to dig into this book was tracing what um, objects from their households traveled with them when they went from castle to castle, as great aristocrats do. Mm-hmm. And it was phenomenal. So I, I learned how much you can learn from simple lists of things. Mm-hmm. And how, ha- how something is listed tells you so much about what is going on and who is doing the listing and so on. Mm-hmm. Were there any objects that you you had no idea what they were, or had a, or didn't have a very good idea that you had to dig in and research? Yes, there there were over the years there were quite a few, and of course, not terribly surprisingly, when you go looking up a particular term, it doesn't exist in modern dictionaries <laughs> because the object no longer exists in modern dictionaries. Now you, you really have to dig around sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, one of the ones that, that I came across, and off the top of my head, I don't even remember the French term for it, was a, a frame, a kind of a lattice thing that was put on top of beds so that dogs would not ruin the bed hang. <laughs> so, so basically, sort of like how we put stuff on walls to keep pigeons off, they had that for... Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because you have to remember that there were beds, people lived quite differently. There were beds in almost every room, and bed hangings were some of their most valuable possessions. Cloth textiles were very valuable, high-quality textiles, and dogs were everywhere. Hmm. So, um, you know, but it took me a long time to decipher that when I first ran across it. Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um what did you find for this particular book? Um, what did you find that was most surprising to you? Hmm. Most surprising to me was how, uh, I think, looking back, I would say most surprising was how important the other objects in their world were to them, in addition to swords. How, For example, there was one will that was quite riveting that I found that was produced in Britain in the 14th century. And the man who divided his belongings amongst his four sons, it was very clear that he was most concerned with making sure they each got a good coat of mail, Hmm. chain mail, Mm -hmm. and that that was the most precious thing he could give them. So it's it's I had to recalibrate my own expectations. In other words, I went into this thinking with in some of the same terms of fantasizing and fetishizing that I was trying to overturn. Mm-hmm. You know, that swords must be the most important thing. In fact, they coexisted with lots of other things and I I had to learn to see that in the records. Hmm. Can you name the most expensive sword? or the most um, elaborate sword that you came across, whether you actually saw it in person or just saw it described in a list? Or, or I mean, whether it exists. It so. probably would be the sword that's on the cover of the book, which is the supposed um, sword of Charlemagne, hmm. which, of course, post-dates Charle- the Charlemagne was crowned in the year 800, and this sword post-dates him. Hmm. But um, it, it has been re furbished and embellished over the centuries. It was a sword that crowned Napoleon Emperor. Mm-hmm. And it's um, a very striking object. I have seen it, and it's a very striking object, as you can see from the book cover. But, you know, there are other descriptions of swords that, that also seem, for example, one of 
one of the kings of France that had enamel work done on the hilt. And it's the kind of enamel that um, is almost no longer practiced by jewelers and so on today. So I imagine it was quite impressive. Mm-hmm. But you can't you can't reconstruct most of these things. They were in the, they were in the habit of of uh, changing things a lot. Swords had to be fashionable too. So you know everything from reliquaries to swords could be refurbished and made to look different. Hmm. Whenever someone had the money to do it. Mm-hmm. Which um, for for each of the two regions, France and Britain, would you would you be able to name the monarch in each that was most in love with swords? <laughs> most in love with swords. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure I know who was who was most in love with swords. Um, I know who. Uh, you know Edward the Third of England. He he dies in 1377. Hmm. Um, he he lived a long time and was a in his early years was a very effective, very popular monarch. And he's the one who for whom we have lots of records of things he gave away at different intervals at various celebrations and so on. Hmm. Um, and uh, perhaps his later contemporary Charles V of France. Mm-hmm. Would be the same. Okay, just cu- curious. Just a, that's just like a little curious trivia type question um, that popped in my head. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Um, was there? And I know w- with research like this, there's lots of gaps and lots of um, lots of questions still. But was there a particular question that that you really wanted to get an answer to that was very the most difficult to research, and maybe you did? come to some conclusion or, or it's still an open question for you? Again, that's a really good question. I I found it frustrating that, you know, back before about 1300, there are so few records of the actual objects that a typical um, active warrior of whatever level hmm. would have had. You only get glimpses and... Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that people are going to stumble across in archives all over the place. They come to light randomly. Mm-hmm. And I found that very frustrating. Um, and I, I, I think it would be interesting to know much more than we do about the world of objects around the average warrior before records began to be kept. We just know a few things about a few examples, and that's all. And do you know why, and I'm sorry if you mentioned that earlier in this discussion, but do you know why you have that jump from why why records suddenly started to be kept or, or were preserved versus the, the previous period? Yeah, because you need you need to have, I mean, obviously there, it's not as abrupt as I may have made it sound, but it, um, you, you have two problems. One, creating the records in the first place, and secondly, having the records survive. Mm-hmm. And... They're, those are two separate problems. Mm-hmm. To create the records in the first place, you have to have enough money to support the work of the clerk who makes the records. All right. And um, and you have to have enough ob- enough stuff around you to make it worth keeping track of it. Mm-hmm. Okay? So that doesn't you don't get that interest in what literacy can provide or the means to produce documents like that until around 1300 more or less now surviving is the next question and Mm -hmm. there you have to ask yourself to survive for a document to survive it has to continue to have value to the people who created it and most of the documents that were created were as i said they were snapshots in time they were a record of the stuff i'm going to take to my next castle and there the record is created so that the the people who are responsible for moving all of those objects are held responsible in case they lose something or pilfer something. Mm -hmm. So a hundred years later, nobody cares about that document, that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And around 1500 or so, you begin to see great aristocrats starting to spend time and money, that is to say, employing people, to start trying to create little archives of all of their documents and to make sense of them. Mm-hmm. But they, even then, they don't really refer back to documents. It's really quite 
luck, really it's luck that, that means that we can get them in the present. Hmm. So it just makes me think that um, as far as the point about having the money to um, pay for Clark's uh, kingdom or, a, you know, whatever ruler, um, to have that kind of money also also talks to the um, sort of the political and eco- economic um, situation of that region, you know, where where you can live above just subsist- subsistence and survival to where you can actually gather resources for, for sort of a luxury use in a sense. Exactly, exactly. And keep in mind there's one other factor here, which is by around 1200, there there are large merchant centers like the great cloth-producing cities in what is today Belgium, Bruges, and Ypres and Ghent, for example, and financial centers like London. And the, the people who are generating the most records are the merchants. Mm-hmm. And the, the king and the great counts and dukes, they all want a cut of that world of, of commerce. They have to compete. They have to keep their own records. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. So that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the impetuses for all of this. Interesting. Now, I know this is history, and it can be well, obviously dry, you know, whether or not you enjoy it. But was there anything... Um, that emotionally moved you in what you read, um, either positively or negatively. Yes, I, I, yeah, there were a number of, of documents. I mean, it's hard to read a will of any kind without being moved by it, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you do come across wills, and you come across people who have whose um, documents are being inventoried because they have died, and. People are allowed, their friends and relations are allowed to come and buy things from their estate. Mm -hmm. And you see people buying the most bizarre things of all the things they could buy. They they cart off used saddle blankets (laughs) and this sort of thing. And you really get that you get little windows into into people's worlds that way. Mm -hmm. I would say the most moving thing I ran across was one record of a man's uh, after his death, and it records what was in his room, the room where he died. Hmm. And I talk about this at some length, because in, he was a Protestant aristocrat at the end of the 16th century who wrote a lot during his lifetime. He wrote memoirs and things. Hmm. And his room has lots of books in it and two swords. Hmm. And I found that quite moving in the sense that he needed to keep his swords with him because, of course, a big chateau would have arms in lots of places. Mm-hmm. And he he kept swords and books. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So apart from filling the historical gap um, or the historical record or adding to the record, um, what do you hope this book will do for readers? I hope that it will have several things. First of all, it, it is a law, it's a survey through a lot of centuries and I hope a fairly readable form so that people who don't know much about the centuries can still learn something. I aimed it at a wider readership. Secondly, I hope people will understand that what we think we value in the present is, is created in the present. It's not an authentic attachment to a past experience of people who lived differently and had different attachments. We need to recognize our own fantasies for what they are. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's how I end the book. Um, and also, uh, as a third point, I think it's important to realize that our attachment to the sword is a form of fantasizing about violence is somehow romantic. Mm-hmm. And that's a dangerous thing. Yeah. That, w- that, as you alluded to earlier, these are people who wanted to, who needed to perform their right to be violent whenever they felt like it. Mm-hmm. We don't want to live in that world. Yeah. And it's, it's not a good thing to romanticize violence. Yeah. 
it's kind of interesting. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of, you know, Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and you know, Me but, too. <laughs> but but the big things there, you know, you give your little kids, you know, these fake swords and fake lightsabers and it's it looks cool, but if you think about what they're really supposed to be used for, uh it's <laughs> you know. Um Yeah, yeah. It's it's yes, I agree completely. So yeah. I mean, I love swords myself, but, you know. <laughs> Did you have any difficulties getting the book finished or published? Well, I had difficulty getting it finished for all of the life reasons one has. I have two children, and I had an elderly mother for whom I was responsible. Mm. You know, life gets in the way, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, also, this kind of research, it depends on the long chunks of time in the archives. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what medieval records look like, but you have to be trained in paleography to read them, which I have been. Hmm. And But it, it's a long time to digest what you're reading. And most archives until very recently did not permit such photography. Hmm. So I, spent, I had to spend a long time in the archives to get this, and that means a lot of money to go live in London or Paris for extended months of time. So the research took a long time, mm -hmm. um, but that was okay because I was enjoying it, and it, it, as with all writing projects, it finishes itself when it's ready to be finished. Right. So, so what changed that they that they now allow photography in these archives? I think they are. Some of them are getting around it by digitizing their collections which mm. means that you don't get to hold the original documents anymore. Thankfully, almost all my research happened, particularly in France, where they're more persnickety than elsewhere, um, <laughs> before they started digitizing everything. Mm. Um, it's very hard to find things once they're digitized, in my view. Oh. But um, it, 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 um, it, you, can, you can photograph, Mostly they started doing it because of the demand of readers to do it and because that way they can protect documents from um, photocopying, which damages them. The mm. heat from photocopying damages them. Ah. So that was, um, one, I, I think that was one of the reasons, and they simply couldn't say no after a certain amount of time. The problem is, is that if you're dealing with a medieval document, the paleography makes it hard to read the thing. I mean, you think about the contrast between the ink and the surface after 500 or 700 or 800 years. Right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're talking about faded scripts. If you photograph something, you aren't necessarily making it any more readable for yourself. And you have to digest what you're reading before you know whether it's worth photographing. Mm -hmm. So mostly I did all of my work in situ in real time. Mm -hmm. I can imagine with photography and, and sort of photo adjustments now that photographs of some of these might be able to draw out elements that you couldn't see with the naked eye, you know, maybe faded, you know, anything like that. Yeah, they, that is possible. It's, um, but you still are, have the dilemma of you need to know what you're looking at in order to know whether it's valuable enough to waste the time photographing it. And in some cases, paying the fee to photograph every day, you have to pay a fee. Hmm. Um, my most recent work has been in a, uh, on a new project, has been at the Imperial War Museum in London. And every time you want to photograph, you have to get a daily pass to do it. So you hmm. sort of hoard up your ph photographic needs for one day. And then uh, you pay the fee and <laughs> photograph everything. <laughs> I see. Yeah, so, so, so I, was, I don't, I don't begrudge them their money, believe me, but it, it does create a management problem, you know. Right. So tell me about this. So um, tell me about this um, next writing project of yours. Oh well, it's a big leap. It's on World War One. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the reasons that I got interested in World War One is because World War One is sufficiently distant in time from us now that we have learned to ask some very good ethnographic questions about the people who gladly went to war in 1914. Mm -hmm. Basically, we've learned to ask, what on earth in their world made them think this was a good idea? Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And that's a, the that's a kind of question we mostly don't ask about the Middle Ages. We think it's all self-explanatory, that, that they were either sort of... Um, 
you know, primitive people who didn't know better or they were just like us, mm. you know, and it was all politics and strategy. So the same kinds of questions that we ask about people who went to fight in 1914, in other words, we know we have an interpretive burden on our hands. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, helped me when I went back and did this research on floors. So now I'm returning to World War I, and I'm looking at chaplains at the front in World War I. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't gotten very far yet, so I'm not exactly sure where that project is going to go. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting, that much I will tell you. Yeah. All right, the thing that pops into my my mind when you say that is just the sheer amount of human carnage from, you know, artillery and just the mass mass destruction weaponry um right. that was available. Anyway. So where can people find you online? Do you have a website or social media or anything? I have a website, uh it's mm hmm so that's K R I S T E N N E U S C H E L dot com. That's right. Cool. Um, all right. So that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? No, but thank you for your very good questions. I appreciated them. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep track of my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. Thanks for listening.